Today, I'm going to introduce you to someone who was a vegetarian for 15 years, but is now a butcher and a farmer. Stay tuned. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today, I am super excited to introduce you to Kate Cavanaugh. Now, all of her information will be linked down in the show notes. She has a podcast, an Instagram page, and she's just a really, really cool person. I really enjoyed this conversation, and we touched on so many amazing topics. You can find all those topics listed down in the show notes so that you can kind of surf around if you'd like to and look at the different things that we spoke about. But I think this conversation is very important and it needs to be shared with many, many people. So if you have someone who is looking to go towards a more meat-based diet or just introduce meat into their diet, period, please do share this video with them. We talk a lot about how to approach sustainable eating. Now, how do we source from a farm? She gives a great resource here, and that's also linked in the show notes as well for you guys, because I think this is a big barrier point to entry for people, that they are kind of afraid to go from the grocery store to working with a farmer. So hopefully there are a lot of great takeaways from this episode for you guys that you can really implement into your daily life. And we talk a lot about health as well and how that is connected to nature on the circadian and circannual rhythm. So that's definitely in there as well. Before we jump into that, I want to thank the two sponsors of today's show. The first one is going to be Optimal Carnivore. I have been using their Brain Nourish product. Really love it. It is Beef Brain and Lion's Mane. I'm also still taking their Organ Complex and I occasionally take the liver. They have a wonderful sustainable product. My code to save there is carnivore uppercase Y. That link will be down in the show notes for you guys. I also give these to my family, so it's not just me that is taking them. And I just love their products. So thank you Optimal Carnivore for sponsoring today's episode. The second sponsor is Upgraded Formulas. I am a huge fan of their magnesium, but I'm an even bigger fan of their hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation because I believe that supplementing should be done carefully and that if we over supplement that we could cause more issues. So using their hair tissue mineral analysis with the consultation is a great way to know what your body actually needs or if you're maybe taking too many things that you do not need. So my code to save there is yogi12 or yogi. Thank you guys for watching today's episode and I'll talk with you again soon. Bye. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming back and tuning into today's episode. I'm very excited to talk with today's guest. Now, Kate is a butcher and a farmer, and we really want to talk today about how she got to do all the amazing things that she's doing, sourcing meat, especially since I know so many of you guys are really big meat eaters and how important that is and how to do that. So thank you for being here today, Kate. Yeah, absolutely. Sarah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So let's just jump right into your story. How did you even get interested in being a butcher? And <laughs> you certainly don't look like the average butcher that I have met before. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, probably not. So my story actually starts in a, in a very peculiar place, which is it starts with me being a vegetarian. And wow. I was a vegetarian for most of my life from age five to 20. And it was something that I became increasingly passionate about in my teenage years. And then all of a sudden, I started having all of these health issues. And I started to wonder what might begin to heal my body. And at about the age of 20, when my health issues had gotten quite bad, I was suffering from a lot of GI issues. I had anxiety, depression, mounting fatigue. And just sort of a general feeling of dis-ease, right? I like this, I like this term dis-ease. And body yes. is not at ease. And in my explorations, I decided that what I wanted to do was I wanted to start eating meat again. At the time I was living in Phoenix, Arizona, and I wanted, I knew that if I was going to start eating meat, I really wanted to know exactly where it was coming from. 
And so I started visiting farmers markets and through those farmers markets, I met farmers and ranchers. I visited with them. I saw their animals and just became really fascinated by me. And then, then I started eating meat again. And so many of those issues, so much of that dis-ease cleared up just within a couple of months of eating meat. And I was really in awe of how, of how this was able to so, not completely, but so wholly heal my body. And I started getting even more curious. So, so it's healed my body and I started looking into regenerative agriculture. And this was 13 years ago. And so it was really mm -hmm. at the beginning of what we consider regenerative agriculture. I think that's something, a term that a lot of us are familiar with now, but then it was really looked at through holistic management. And so this idea that you're utilizing animals to mimic the patterns of nature. And so just like hundreds of years ago, millions and millions of bison, elk, venison, these ruminants roamed the plains of the United States, which would have taken up about 40% of the United States. You're using animals like cattle or goats or sheep in that same mimicry of that pattern to really help build soil and increase water absorption and increase biodiversity in those landscapes. And so I just started getting really curious. Okay, so I've seen how meat can heal my body. And I, I see this amazing technology where meat can really be the impetus for healing land. And I wondered how I could kind of bridge those two together. And mm. so I, I decided that the best way to do that was to give farmers and ranchers a consistent outlet to sell their regenerative meat. And so I went on this journey to learn how to be a butcher. Uh, my husband and I did it together. And so I spent a year as an apprentice and I learned how to break down whole animals. And then I went and I opened up a butcher shop in Denver, Colorado. And so that was that was kind of the, the first piece of, of that journey into the world of meat. Wow. So how did you overcome, you know, from being vegetarian, you were very convicted about it if you did it from like the age of five until 20 you know, how did you overcome that whole thing about animal cruelty and um, saving the environment that I, I mean, I don't know if those were your convictions for being vegetarian. Can you talk about that a little bit? And, and if that was like how you overcame that really? Yeah, absolutely. And so you're right. And my, my convictions really were both around animal cruelty and later as I got into my teen years around the environment and, the way that I, I frame this a lot of the time is that as a little kid, when I had decided to become a vegetarian, I really wanted to avoid death. I didn't want to participate in death. I had experienced a lot of it at a young age and, and had this sort of desire to avoid it at all costs. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to participate in that system. And then when the environmental part came on, you know, I sought a degree in biology. I was really interested in ecology. And what I began to see was that death is inherent in the system of nature, that there is no eating where you avoid death. And so when I saw that, and when I began to really spend more time in nature, and getting to see this firsthand, I started hiking and I started visiting all these farms and ranches. And you start to see that there's this beautiful cycle that happens and that death is a big part of what fuels life. And I think we see this at the most basic when we look at fertilizer, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to the garden store to amend your garden in the summer, you see blood meal and bone meal because that is a big part of what nourishes the soil and fosters a really healthy environment for life. And as I begin to see that, that was really when things turned around for me, that there was this connection there with a cycle that I could see my mm -hmm. place within the cycle too as a predator, as an eater, and as a steward, as a steward of the environment and of the land. 
And so that was really a big piece in what helped me sort of overcome that dogmatic vegetarian viewpoint. Yeah. And I think under, I think what a lot of people that do vegetarian or vegan type of diets, they don't understand is that they're there's no such thing as a bloodless diet. Like you were saying with the fertilizer, you can't grow those plant foods without that death occurring. Correct. Yeah. And you know, so it's not just, you have death occurring on that scale, but I really like to look at it. There's a gentleman named Wes Jackson and he invented this idea of a sunshine study. And so how far out can we look at all the energy inputs into something. And I think you can do the same thing when you're looking at food. And I think as we see plant-based meat and lab-based meat really become bigger in the sphere and they're marketed as these things that completely avoid death, this bloodless meal, as you right. so beautifully put it. But when you're talking about a monocrop of peas to make pea protein, we'll just pick on that, right? Yeah. You're talking about massive machinery and equipment that destroys lots of small mammalian life, voles, rabbits, mice. You're talking about hundreds of acres that displace wildlife. I mean, you're talking about a monocrop. So there is no biodiversity. There is no incentive for birds, for bees, various pollinators, as well as just coyotes and rabbits and all of those, that wildlife to exist there. And so not only is there this literal death in terms of small animals and insects, but there's also death at this other scale of the death of biodiversity, which is truly, you know, nature loves diversity. Yep. It does. Yeah. And that's just, you know, I, I have a really good friend of mine and she's a yoga teacher and she's very well-intentioned, very well-meaning, which I think a lot of vegetarians are, but you know, she's almost 40. And I was explaining to this, this to her, I think she actually just turned 40 and she was just like jaw on the floor, just like, so even if I eat the plants, I'm still killing animals. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yes. like, yeah. And she was having, you know, the whole thing that spurred the conversation is she was having hair fall out. She was feeling tired. She was just having all these health problems. You know, I couldn't make it as long as she has vegetarian. I, I lasted two and a half years and I was done. I was trying to do vegan. Um, but, you know, she was open to having this conversation with me because she was seeing some things go wrong with her health. And, you know, I said, what is your biggest motivation for doing this? Like, why are you really trying to do this? And she's like, I just, like you said, she didn't want to be responsible for death. And it's a very uh, noble thing, I think, for people to do that. But it's, there's a lot of, I don't want to say ignorance, but ignorance. There, is. there is. I think yeah. it's okay. I think it's okay to say that. Yeah. It's just that they just don't know that, that you can't, there's just no such thing. Like I said, as a bloodless diet and yeah, you're not, you're not here to sacrifice your life and be miserable. And, and you fit into this, like you said, this beautiful cycle that nature has, you fit in there. Correct. Yeah. And I think that, I think that ignorance comes from this break that we have with nature that yes. And this happens, I think we really see this happen kind of in two phases. I think it happens a little bit at the genesis of agriculture 10,000 years ago, where we move from really living with the land and with the seasons in this nomadic way into more towns and villages. And we begin to superimpose ourselves on nature. We begin to domesticate plants and animals. And so I think there's a little break there, but then we see this other break with nature around the time of Rene Descartes, I think therefore I am. And we get into this really reductionist model of looking at the world that the heart but when we you um and, you actually froze for a second there <laughs> sorry about that where did i where That's did okay. you lose me the last part that i heard was um the renee descartes yeah um, yeah 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 so renee descartes 
has this, I think therefore I am. And around this time, you see a really reductionist mo model of looking at nature, of looking at everything. And you see linear mathematics come in and we kind of lose this cyclical thinking that nature really leads us into, right? When we live with nature, we live with cycles. We see the seasons change. We see the moon change. We see this life into death, into life again. And, and that break really happens. And then we get further down the line into reductionist models of medicine, you know, mm -hmm. in the allopathic Western medicine, where you have a heart surgeon and you have a gastrointestinal doc, and those two things don't talk to one another. You know, your, yeah. your, your heart and your guts have nothing to do with one another, even though they're in the same body. And so we see this real deep reductionist thinking and when in truth, when you spend time in nature, I think you get to see this amazing thing where the sum of the parts are greater than the whole. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, I feel like you and I've been having these kind of fun little conversations on Instagram, just because I've been putting up these posts that are, I think a little triggering to some people in my community, because I want them to go like higher level than they're going, go beyond um, protein and fat ratios go beyond these things and think about, you know, your body as a system, think about, um, nature and how we're connected to it on a 24 hour cycle and how we're connected to it on a yearly cycle, you know, and one of the things that I see is a huge problem is that we never actually experience winter. You know, we have this eternal summer going on where we can just keep the lights on at night, you know, the sun goes down at five 30, but we keep the lights on and turn the heat on and get the TV going. And it's like our body experiences summer year round. And that's, you know, that time in winter is when we're supposed to have darkness. We're supposed to make more melatonin. We're supposed to sleep more, have more scarcity, not have, you know, all these foods that we have shipped over from Mexico and all around available to us. And I think that we have as a whole completely lost those connections. And, you know, people are like, oh, I have this problem. I have this problem. And I'm like, you have to look at your body as this connected being to nature, to these cycles. And I think a lot of the health problems that people have, yeah, we could separate gut and separate skin and separate this and the other are really, can are really because they have lost that complete connection to the seasons, to nature, to the earth. And the body is losing so much energy because we have, we don't have that correct connection to that magnetism anymore. We're just, we're, we're trying to do, we're trying to outsmart nature constantly. Right. Yeah. I think that's exactly what it is. And I, and I think it feels really easy to focus on your macros yeah. when really, <laughs> when really you're, you're looking at the foods that you're eating and the places that they come from and how they connect into nature and how yes. you connect into that. And what an incredible governing body of our biology that nature is, that we are yes. tied to a circadian rhythm and the light that rises with the sunrise and, and sets with the sun and how that regulates our biology. We are governed by that even just in, in our vision, right? That when yes. we see, when we go into panoramic vision and we're looking at a vista, our parasympathetic nervous system turns on. Or we're, when we hear bird song, our parasympathetic yes. nervous that relax and digest turns on because bird song indicates the absence of predators. And you are so intimately connected into nature that that is a part of governing your biology. And then you see that on the annual, on the circannual rhythm, yes. where your, your sleep cycles and your digestion are changing with what's available in your environment. Yes. And winter affords us many things. I mean, it's not just more melatonin, but I would argue it's more brown fat, because oh, we're yes. cold Absolutely. and so there's the cold. Yeah. Yeah. That cold is going to add deposition to brown fat, which is going to change your metabolism over the long term yep. and really be beneficial. You're also 
getting a chance to probably, at least from, from an evolutionary standpoint, spend more time in ketosis because you really only yep. do have access to animal foods, to animal fat that it has, that's all that could be preserved over winter. And right. so there are all of these tie-ins. And I think when we make an effort little bit closer to nature, right? We have these four walls and a roof that separate us. But when we go outside our door and begin to live, all of a sudden you want more of that and you feel it in your biology. You feel that connection and that change. Yeah, I agree. And it's just getting people to kind of I think people think it's too simple. I was having this conversation with a good friend of mine yesterday. I think people think the whole connection to nature and being outdoors more and seeing sunrise and, and all of those things, they're like, oh, but that's, that's never gonna, <laughs> that's never gonna elicit change. Like I have to, I have to go pay a functional medicine doctor thousands of dollars for blood work and supplements like to get better. And I've seen so many people take that route and do that and then end up broke and no better off, you know, just a cabinet full of supplements and maybe they feel a little bit better, but yeah, they, they, it doesn't get rid of the, the root cause, you know? So I feel like this whole message of, of being more connected to the earth and connected to, um, what's available in nature is really the key for a lot of people in, in healing, honestly. I really think that a lot of the issues that we're facing as, as we become sicker uh, as a, as a society and as rates of autoimmune diseases skyrocket and diabetes and obesity, I think that there's a lot to be said for healing that connection with nature first. And yeah. if you're not getting out to see sunrise every day and to allow that infrared light just to heal your cells, then start there before you start with a functional medicine doctor and before yeah. you start down this path. Start with, you know, going outside barefoot. Start with spending more time outside and just getting to be a part of those cycles and getting to plug in and connect in that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about your journey too. So I know you've been doing the butcher thing for 10 years, right? That's correct. And, and so now you're into farming. Can we talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So I had a really unique opportunity as a butcher to get to see an animal's life cycle from the outside in is kind of how I relate this, that when you're a butcher, you see these animals and you know the farms that they came from and their raising practices, and you get to see that manifested in carcass composition. So in the amount of inter and intramuscular fat and the color of that fat and Mm. the color of the meat and just kind of how this animal has is a reflection of the life that it's led and the farming practices that have been a part of it. And through that journey, my husband and I got really curious about raising some animals for ourselves and really getting to play with some of the things that we saw. And one of the first things that we wanted to do was play with low polyunsaturated fatty acid uh, pork and chicken. And so I'm super passionate about holistic grazing and ruminants. And so that's one piece of this, but this other piece really interested me. So I think maybe a lot of your audience might be familiar with sourcing things. You want pasture raised pork and pasture raised chicken, but something that's embedded within that, that I don't think is discussed often enough is what those animals are eating. Yeah. When we get into 100% grass fed and finished beef and lamb, they're just eating plant matter. And so it's sort of easy to, to set that aside, but pigs and chickens are omnivores just like we are. And so they're going to eat a much wider variety of food sources and they're monogastric animals. So they have one single stomach. They don't have this fancy fermentation chamber like cattle or like sheep. And so they're often fed a a mix of grains and these grains are predominantly corn and soy. And what happens is the polyunsaturated fatty acids that are in corn in soy in sunflower in flaxseed in they even feed, I love this one, rapeseed, which is what they use to make canola oil. 
Oh, geez. And so those are going to accumulate into that animal's fat structure and make it more composed of this inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid that I think has a lot of correlation between insulin resistance and autoimmune diseases. You know, we see that our cell membranes 50, 60 years ago were seven to nine percent. Uh, linoleic acid. And now that number is upwards of 25%. And so I think this has really changed our, I think that, so one of my goals as a farmer was to really play with this idea of taking corn and soy and sunflower and all of these other harmful oils out of the feed sources for our animals. Mm. And do you notice a huge difference in the taste or just the overall health of the animals, I guess, is a better question than taste. <laughs> do you see a difference in the animals with the different feed? I actually think they're both really question, really good questions. Yeah. Taste actually correlates to nutrient density. Yes. And so we see, you know, you see vegetables having lost about 30% of their nutrient density over the last 60 years because they're not pulling those nutrients out of the soil, the soil and meat yeah. losing about 10 to 15. And so taste is correlated. Like when something tastes really good just on its own, just with a little bit of salt, that does correlate to its nutrient density. And so I think that's a good question. We see it both in the health of our animals. Our animals are incredibly vibrant. They have beautiful body compositions. They move through the seasons really beautifully and we hold her a little bit longer. But we also see it in when we butcher them. We see mm -hmm. firmer fat and we see a better distribution of fat. So I see less visceral adipose tissue just in our pigs. And I see it more spread intermuscularly and at healthy amounts. I don't see what you sometimes see as a butcher, which is just excessive amounts of visceral adipose tissue. And so we've seen it in everything. And we've also sent our pork chops off for testing and it's yeah. tested lower in polyunsaturated fatty acids. Cool. And so, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and so you do notice a difference in the taste, like it's a, a, what kind of, is it like more rich or just what kind of a taste difference is there? Yeah. So it's going to be a lot richer, a lot, I'm not going to say gamier, but there is hmm. that next level. Leaner, it's, a, yeah. it, it's a really powerful taste. Um, it's not necessarily super lean. Our poor, our pigs are still relatively fatty. Um, mm. and so, and our chickens have some fat as well on them, but the fat on our chickens is super yellow. Even the fat on our pork leans a little bit yellow, which is very rare. And so you can just, you can see that through and through. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I think this is a new topic. And I think there's been, there's definitely been a lot of pushback in the, you know, carnivore space, which I'm kind of just slowly disassociating with a little bit. I mean, I still like to be, you know, someone who's known as an advocate for eating meat, but I think there's a lot of crazy dogma and things like that in that, in that particular community. But when, when this kind of came out a few years ago, people started talking about it. There was like a major, major uproar and people were really pissed off that, you know, we'll, we're not eating Doritos, you know, we're doing better than, than eating what's at the grocery store. And there still is pushback when you start talking about um, sourcing your meat properly. I get that a lot. You know, if I ever talk about meat sourcing or trying to find a local farmer, I get a ton of pushback from people saying, I can't afford that. That's just, you know, it's better for me to just shop at the grocery store than eat Doritos and Pop-Tarts, which I do agree with. I agree with but, that too. You know, how can we kind of bridge that gap for people so that they're, they kind of get rid of that mentality. If I can't do it, it's too expensive. It's too hard. Like how, how can we really make that a little bit more approachable for people? I think that this is a really important conversation and there are a couple of different ways I like to think about it. And the first is our food is an investment in our health. Yes. It's an investment in our ecosystem. It's an investment in our community. And yeah. I think it's important to consider it from that lens. Americans on average 
spend between nine and 11% of their income on food where the rest of the world spends about 30%. And wow. so that's a pretty big gap there. And I would say in my house, we spend at least 30%. Oh yeah, mine too. <laughs> yeah, <at laughs> mine too. Uh, more than that. And yeah, we, make, we make sacrifices in order for yes. that to happen. My husband yes. and I drive a super old, I drive a 97 Forerunner. You know, we yeah. don't buy yeah. new TVs or computers. Uh, yeah. We don't spend a lot of money on entertainment or travel, hair, food. nails, all yep. the things. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> all of those things. And all of that goes back into food. And we really yeah. do invest time into that as well. My husband and I cook two meals a day, every day, though we often batch cook, which I think makes things a bit easier. Definitely. And so there's, first of all, shifting perspective to this idea that food is an investment is an investment in your health and your longevity too, that, that I want my health. And the other piece in this is sort of looking at the way that we purchase food a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And as a, yeah, we're looking at animals, this particularly way that it's just cheaper to go to the grocery store and to get a couple of steaks and that the, you know, community to get a share. So to get a share of beef or a share of pork where you're, you're buying into a quarter or a half or a whole animal, and you're getting this bulk amount of meat, you're getting, you know, anywhere from probably 15 to a hundred plus pounds, depending on what you've bought into, but you're getting a lower flat rate price per pound. And so with a share, you know, where you normally might spend, depends on where you are in, in these times, yeah. but anywhere from like 18 to $50 per pound on a ribeye or a tenderloin, you're just flat rate, you know, let's call it $10 a pound, which is a decent average for grass-fed beef. Yeah. And then you're putting it in the freezer. And so this can be a really great way to save money. But again, it requires sort of a shift in thinking. And I think that we also don't see all the other places we're saving money when we buy into a share because you're saving money on trips to the grocery store. So you just have it in your freezer, pull it out, you thaw it, dinner is ready. Uh, you're, saving, you're saving time going to the grocery yeah. store, which time is money. Um, yeah. And so I think that this is a really good way of looking at that. And the other thing yeah. I'd say... You know, if you're close to a butcher shop that does grass-fed beef, pick pick lesser cuts. We get really stuck in the New York Strip ribeye tenderloin crowd. <laughs> yeah, but ground beef is incredible and yeah. collagen rich, which is awesome. Yeah. You have a really nice methionine to glycine ratio, which is going to be really great for everything. Um, and look at braising cuts. Look at those round roasts and chuck mm -hmm. rolls. Chuck those roast, are going yeah. to be, yeah, those are going yeah. to be cheaper. And again, all of that, that collagen supplement you're buying, you don't need it you because it's in, your, it's in your meat and you can just, <laughs> yes. you can just braise it and it turns into that gelatinous and unctuous meal that is so good for you. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I feel like that's another thing. People think like, if you switch over to a more meat-based diet, you're supposed to eat ribeyes all day. And that's <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is just make a slow roast, you know, a big roast and just slow roast it slow and low. And then you could literally take a, a meat slicer, slice it up super thin and eat that for days. I mean, for the week, honestly, make all kinds of different meals with it. So it doesn't, you don't have to, I haven't, my grill actually is gathering dust right now. Like I haven't been using my grill. I've just been slow roasting crock pot or the instant pot, you know, ground beef on the stove. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be hard at all. No, and it doesn't have to be fancy or precious in this way either. My husband and I cook usually in batches of 10 to 12 pounds and we'll do a yep. big braise of a roast and we'll pull it apart. So it's just pulled meat. And I actually package it in little glass jars and it goes in the freezer. Yep. And when dinner comes around every night, we usually have between three and five different proteins all jarred up that are ready to just 
pop in a pan and be done. And so I spend one day cooking all of our protein every, about every two weeks. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, and so many people are like, I'm busy. I don't have time for this. And it's like, you don't need hours a day. You don't need a fancy grill. I mean, I, ha- I haven't even used my grill in a couple of months. I just haven't, you know, you don't need all of these things. I think that people, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like people just try to talk themselves out of, mm. of healthier lifestyle. Yeah. Um, they just try to argue for their limitations and that can be frustrating. Um, but for anybody who you know, want d- seize these barriers that just let them all go. <laughs> like it's, it's really yeah. not, it's not a thing. It can be really easy. It can be really simple. It's only as complicated as you make it is one of right. the things I would tell people. And we can make this really easy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And as far as, you know, kind of seasonal eating, can we talk about that a little bit? Because yeah. you touched on that earlier and that's, that's one big shift for me. That's kind of taken me out of carnivore, you know, so much because shoot, I just got a beautiful batch of strawberries here, (laughs) you know, from my farmer and I'm sure as hell going to be eating those, but I don't have those in December. I don't have those in January. So can we talk a little bit about how that plays in for you and how you practice that? Yeah. I love this question because I think that seasonal eating can be a really great way to dip in and out of some of these, these diets to dip in and out of keto, to dip in and out of carnivore and to really find a sense of balance and homeostasis just within our own bodies. And so for me with seasonal eating, we spend, so we're in, we're on the Vermont, New York border and we have a pretty long winter. Yeah, <laughs> that, absolutely. <laughs> that composes most of my year. I, I joke wow. that we have nine months of winter and, yeah. and three months of summer. And so during the summer, I really take advantage of, of what nature provides me with here on the farm. And so my husband and I are foragers. You know, right now we've just finished up eating ramps and so we ramp tops from the forest, um, which is one of the few. I, I don't eat a ton of vegetables but I will a little bit during the spring and the summer. Ramps are one of them. We forage for morel mushrooms, which are available to us. And then as summer progresses, there will be more fruit. There will be apples and there will be tons of berries. And to me, yes. this, is, this is a seasonal time for me to engage with where I am in space and time. And I think that food is a really elegant conversation that we're having that is bridging the gap between our bodies and our environment. And Mm -hmm. so that food, it really is information to our bodies, where we are in place and time, how much sun there is. If you're eating a berry that is telling your cells, like we are at the peak of summer, there is all of this sun, there is all of this abundance. And now is the time to indulge in that fructose, to indulge Mm -hmm. in, in the sugars that are in fruit and to really begin to, to store something different for winter in terms of nutrients even. Yeah. And I agree. So I love this about seasonal eating. And then as we progress into the fall, that's when my husband and I are out there processing animals and putting them in the freezer. We're out hunting deer and other, you know, we'll hunt some small game as well and really filling our freezers for, for the winter. And throughout the winter, we predominantly eat meat, fat, organs. And that's about it because that's, that's what's offered to us within our environment. And I think if you're closer to the equator, maybe things look a little bit different, especially because you are getting, you're getting all that vitamin D or hormone D, however you want to (laughs) categorize that your body's creating all of that vitamin D and you have a very different cascade of nutrients from the environment, you know, nutrients from light, but in that dark space, I think our metabolisms shift and really want to conserve energy. And I don't think there's any better way to conserve energy than to go into that phase of carnivory. Yep. I agree. I mean, this winter was the first time I think I was actually like leaner in the winter than I was in the summer. (laughs) 
<laughs> because I followed that seasonal eating and I allowed myself to get cold. I mean, I did some, I don't live where you live. I'm in Georgia. So I think somewhere like in Georgia, you probably would want to do a little more cold plunging. I don't know if you would need to do it <laughs> up where you live because you could just go outside. Um, but just embracing the winter, embracing what's available and really getting to know your local farmer, getting to know what's growing. Like we've got, like I said, we've got strawberries, we're getting, um, we're getting some vegetables, we're getting some fruits, some things like that are becoming available. Um, and I, this year I'm like, yeah, we're going to enjoy those things. We're going to eat those things. I'm not trying to, oops, sorry, trying to stick to a particular diet dogma and, you know, have some sort of a label because that's not, the way nature intended. Nature didn't intend for us to be vegan or carnivore. Nature intended us for us to enjoy these different foods at different times of the year, right? Yeah, to enjoy the abundance of where we live and to utilize that as information to have exactly. this conversation at a cellular level. Right. Right. Because food is light code. Like you were saying, exactly. you know, the light that's available. One of my friends is a, a, um, a gardener. I want to get him on at some point, but he was, he had his whole plate of strawberries today. He's up in Oregon and he's like, yeah, we just got these because you can't have strawberries unless the UV index is over a six. And it's just now starting to be over a six and these are available. And I'm like, yes, finally, someone's like, and he's getting such a huge following because people are like, oh, I think people are starting to want to have these types of conversations because I think a lot of people are sick and tired of like different diet cults. And, and I think the biggest thing is they see that they're, they're not working for them. You know, they may work for certain times like carnivore in the winter, fabulous, but absolutely not necessary for everybody in the summer, honestly, really isn't and can confuse your body. I believe too. I do too, because I think that is information coming in yep. and those yep. strawberries are communicating something that I think we are only just beginning to understand at a scientific level to your body about where you are in space and time. And I think too, it is, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, eating vegetables year round and being exposed to these nutrients that are at times antagonistic to our bodies, yes. it isn't good either. And so, yeah. you know, two sides of the same coin, we're having that break and eating mostly meat is doing yeah. our body a lot good. of favors. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. You're not, you know, as Dr. Cruz says, you're not supposed to have a banana in the middle of January, you know, <laughs> Just, no, it no, not exist. No, it doesn't exist. Maybe it does at the equator. I, I don't at think the equator, it, yeah. it does there, but uh, and it's being flown in. And so the closer right. I think we can connect to farmers and ranchers that are right near where we live, right near home, the better. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So what are your some of your favorite resources for helping people connect to local farmers and local sources? Do you have any of those? Yeah, I do. So I actually just helped build a website that helps people connect with meat near them. Oh. Um, which I think is, and it has a bunch of filtering mechanisms because we're all looking for something specific. If you're looking for low PUFA meat, or if you're looking for bison in particular, or if you're looking for yak. And so it's called nearhome.groundworkcollective.com. You can also just find it on groundworkcollective.com, but it is a directory of over 2000 farms all across the country, and you can filter them out and find exactly what you're looking for in terms of meat. I think mm. other great ways to do this are to go to farmers markets and to start to get yes. to know your farmers and to then maybe even visit them at their farm. I think yes. that that gives you a little piece to buy into both an investment in yourself, but also this investment in community food mm. I think for the majority of, of homo sapien, right? The last 200,000 years, most of food has really been consumed and enjoyed in community that we we hunted mm -hmm. and gathered it together and then we sat around a fireplace and shared it as we shared information and so i think that when you can connect i think that there's something to be said for that process too in in conferring health that when you get to see where your animals are being raised or you get to visit the farmer that's raising your strawberries something happens yeah. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. And, and knowing exactly where your food came from. I mean, I think we, like we were talking about in the beginning of this conversation, we've just become so disconnected from nature, from our food, from, from everything, because we're on our devices, we're, you know, inside of a building going to work, which I know a lot of people have to do that. Um, that's just part of their life, but finding these ways that, you know, if we do have to live this modern life, that how we can connect back, because it is, it is a matter of our health. I really and truly believe that it is affecting our health on a really deep level. So finding things like, like you, what you're suggesting, and I'll definitely put that website um, in the show notes for everybody. I think those things are very, very important. I think it's really important too. And I'm always curious, you know, if you do look at evolutionary biology for the last, you know, 200,000 years of modern homo sapien, most of our pursuit would have been around food. Our days would have been consumed by hunting and gathering and preparing and uh, preparing for winter for preserving. And so I wonder at times when that would have taken up the majority of our day, if there's something of a void missing in, Mm -hmm. in terms of pursuing and interacting with our food. I agree. I think that there definitely is, I think there's a huge void. And I think that that could definitely be causing more health issues as well. I mean, it's, it's all connected. It's all related. And just this loss of connection with um, the earth and the magnetism of the earth is changing. And just, there's so many things at at play for sure. Yeah. This is a chance to connect into that electromagnetic field of earth and to go walk on soil, to go walk on grass, to ground in that way. Yeah. And I mean, just on kind of that same topic, there's so many people with gut issues now. And I, you know, have been trying to understand gut issues for the last three years because I had them horribly myself. So did I. And eat, yeah, eating carnivore helped, but then I had to go further than carnivore. And I would say the biggest things that helped me heal my gut were the circadian biology was, you know, being connected to the sun. Everyone's like, oh, I can't, <laughs> like I had a conversation today on Instagram. Someone's like, well, I can't go to the bathroom in the morning unless I have my coffee. And I'm like, well, that's a problem. Yeah. That's a problem. That's constipation. Yeah. That's constipation. If you start seeing sunrise daily, get rid of the coffee. The sunrise actually triggers that bowel movement in the morning. Believe it or not, that's what's supposed to happen. Like that's how your body is supposed to work. If you have that connection to nature and I see more and more now people not being connected to nature, never walking barefoot, never touching soil. You know, they have the microbiome diversity issue. They're out of sync with light. There's, you know, light receptors in the gut and in all of our body. And when you're out of sync with that, I feel like, yeah, there's things that can help like digestive enzymes and probiotics and stuff. But before you go spend all your money on that, why don't you try some of (laughs) something free? something easy, free, yeah. connect with nature, watch the sunrise, walk barefoot on the earth, touch the soil. Yeah. And let's just see if that doesn't help because that, you know, all the supplements and things I took all this, this winter doing that being barefoot, doing cold therapy, I my gut issues. I can eat whatever I want without having a massive reaction now. And I'm not trying to, I don't abuse that, you know, but if I wanted to indulge in whatever, whoever cooked at Christmas time, I did. And I didn't have consequences. I was, I was fine. You know, my body was like able to detoxify from, you know, from eating that thing. Right. I think there's this really interesting question embedded in there is that is part of our dis-ease a disconnection and is the antidote connection to connect back in. And people ask me all the time, do you take probiotics? Do you take this? It's like, I don't take, I get my hands in soil. I pet my animals. I spend time in the forest where you're literally breathing in probiotics that are populating your nasal passages, which are then traveling through your throat and into your gut. You know, that there's this whole process of spending time in nature that populates that But at the same time, and I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, I think there's some really interesting analogs when we look at the health of our environment and the health of humans. And I think Mm. that microbiome health is 
where I see this the most. And I think it's analogous to soil health. And we're seeing yes. a massive decline in soil health, both in terms of all of the nutrients that are present in soil. We're seeing massive topsoil erosion, the end of fertility. You know, there are some yeah. people that put estimates of there being 50 harvests left on earth. And I don't, I wow. don't agree with that, but we are declining in soil fertility at the same time that our microbiome health is declining. Yeah. And, and so our fertility is declining as well. I mean, at it's... 1% per year, Shauna yeah. Swan's book, there's a book by Shauna Swan called Countdown, and it looks at sperm counts have declined 1% per year uh, since I think at least the 70s. And, wow. and so our fertility is, is tapering off. And I really think that what we see is a mirror, that the microcosm, in this case us, is a mirror for the macrocosm, which is nature or the environment. Yeah. And I really think that there's this aspect that when we look to heal ourselves in this way, we are also healing our environment because our connection to that space and our investment in it changes. I agree. I agree. It go, it goes so deep. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I get people on my page all the time asking me, I'm sure you do too, about just these specific health issues. And it's mm -hmm. like, like I said, in the beginning, let's back out of, you know, the, the stomach doctor, the, the dermatologist, the brain doctor, like, let's stop this, like, sectioning off of things and start to back out and look at things as a whole, right? Yeah, exactly. The sum of the parts is even greater than the whole. Like there, yeah. there is, there is even more there that we don't understand. And I call it, and I talk about this a lot on my podcast, there's just a little bit of magic, which I think is just this aspect of science that we don't yet have the language for. Yeah. And that happens when we step out and we get sunlight in our eyes first thing upon waking, or we see the sunrise every day. I mean, that's my yep. goal in a very Jack Cruz way. I want to see yep. the sunrise every day and I want to see the yes. sunset yep. every yes. day. Yep. I agree. I agree. And it's once you start doing it, you don't really want to stop. I mean, when I, when someone first told me I needed to do that for my health, I just kind of rolled my eyes and I was like, why that's stupid. But at that point I was desperate enough to do it. And then when I started doing it, I was hooked. I was like, Oh, I don't want to miss this to the point where I would, <laughs> I would have bad dreams. And in my dreams, I had missed the sunrise. And that was like the extent of my bad dream. That's like, amazing. That's when I knew I was <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> I might be a little bit out there at this point, but I kind of just don't care because I feel so good. Right. Yeah. And I think I have a question too, because I was I was resistant as well to step yeah. into that space of seeing the sunrise every day. And why are we so resistant to these easy, natural, yes. free fixes? Why is that yeah. the thing that feels harder than yes. seeing all of these specialists for yes. all of these specific disorders that we're experiencing? Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine's a quantum health coach, just like me, and she has a client who's got Lyme and just all these issues. And she said, you know, what I told her that she needed to do was actually go to Mexico and spend like a couple months there and just get in the water, be in the sand. And the woman wanted to just instead go pay a functional medicine doctor, you know, $10,000 to do all this stuff. And, you know, is that going to help? I, I don't really, I don't see it doing what it needs to do, honestly. No, because I think we're just continuing to reduce the parts of our body to reduce our diseases without connecting in to, to something to our natural state. I mean, that's really yeah. what it is, is to get back to what it means to be a human in nature, which we really haven't, we've been disconnected from that for the blink of the eye, right? Like if we're 200,000 years old as modern homo sapiens, we've only really been disconnected from this for the last 100 years extremely and 500 yep. years, maybe. I mean, just this little sliver of time. And so I really think that there's a lot to be gained in reclaiming that connection. I agree. I agree. Well, you mentioned you have a podcast and I'm definitely going to link your social media. Um, what, where can people find you and like, what do you have going on? What, what kind of things are you offering? 
Yeah. So you can find right now, my big thing is this podcast. I really want to tell mm. stories of interconnected themes of mind, body, and soil. And so it's exactly what we talked about here today, because I really believe that all of these things are interconnected. And so I bring on farmers and I bring in experts in nutrition and in health and in meditation. And we're just kind of connecting all of these dots. And so that's called the Groundwork Podcast. And you can find it at groundworkcollective.com which is also where you can find me and you can get a link to the site that nearhome.groundworkcollective.com where you can find me right near you, which I think is great. And then you can find me personally at Kate, Kate, You froze for a minute there. Yeah, you fro- so the last thing you said was I could find you at Kate. I think you were telling your Instagram yeah. handle. Yeah, <laughs> so Kate Kavanaugh um, at Kate, K-A-T-E underscore Kavanaugh, K-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. Awesome. And I'll make sure I link all of that in the show notes so that they can easily connect in and find that your podcast and your Instagram and um, the website for the meet, all the good things. So yeah, I think that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Well, this has been really fun conversation. I think people are going to get a lot out of it. Hopefully have some good light bulb moments and maybe even be motivated to connect with some local sources and, and with local food. So thank you so much for being here today. Sarah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome.